Good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rancho. I'm Pam Lee. I'm the director of Rancho Los Alamitos, and I have the enviable privilege of welcoming you all here to this wonderful event. We're very honored that the Historical Society of uh, Long Beach decided to do their first symposium of three uh, in association with their exhibition, Water Changes Everything. They decided to hold the first one here at the Rancho. We're very pleased. We're very pleased to have all of you here tonight. We think it's a very important topic. Water shaped the development of California from the very earliest days to the present. Decisions made in the past have shaped our present and the challenges that we're dealing with today. And the decisions we make and the decisions our children make are going to affect the future. We're so pleased that you could be with us. Many of you in this room helped make this symposium possible. And some of you, maybe some of the same of <laughs> some of the same people and organizations also helped make the Rancho's film possible, which you're going to see at the end of, of today's uh, uh, event. Uh, we'd like to thank the Long Beach Water Commission and the Long Beach Water Department. We also would like to thank the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the Water Replenishment District, and the Long Beach Office of Sustainability. Last but not least, our thanks to our partner, the Historical Society of Long Beach, for mounting this uh, series of symposia. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the innovative and inspired and my friend, the Executive Director of the Historical Society, Julie Bartolotto. Welcome to the myths and reality of water in Long Beach. First, I'd like to thank our gracious host, Pam Lee and Rancho Los Alamitos and all of your team who made tonight possible and made all the tech work and, and um, we're just really grateful to be here. We designed this program to add information to our current exhibition, which is called Water Changes Everything. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to come to the Historical Society and see it. We're located in Bixby Knowles, and the show is on through June 13th, and you can learn a lot more by seeing that show. Again, I'd like to thank, um, there's, there's an entity that's made all of this possible, and that's the Long Beach Water Department. And I'd like to recognize some of the commissioners who are here tonight. President Harry Saltzgaver is here. Art Levine is here. Director of the Long Beach Water Department, Chris Gardner. The Public Information Officer for the Water Department, Kaylee Weatherly. And we're expecting Commissioner Cordero, Gloria Cordero as well. I'd like to also acknowledge other funders for this project, the Port of Long Beach, Metropolitan Water District, and Kevin McLaughlin is here. I'd like to recognize Kevin. We owe a special thanks to Joe Vanderhorst and Christy Fisher for contributing to the exhibition and contributing to tonight, making it a great success. I'm gonna read through this other list a little more quickly. Um, Union Pacific supported us, the Los Angeles County Supervisor, Janice Hahn, along with the Aquatic Capital of America Foundation, Evan Browdy and Bonnie Lowenthal, John Royce and Kent Lockhart, Lionel and Joanne Gatley, Long Beach City Council Member, Al Austin, Long Beach Development Services, Ron and Marianne Gastelum, and the Water Replenishment District of Southern California, and John Allen is here. Let's recognize Jan John Allen. <laughs> the Historical Society is fortunate to be supported by another group of um, dedicated contributors, and they are Crest Circle members, and many of them are here tonight. Thank you very much for supporting our educational exhibitions and this program. To get started, I'd like to introduce a member of our exhibition committee and retired assistant general counsel of the Metropolitan Water District, Joseph Vanderhorst. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julie. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I really am excited to see such a nice crowd. Uh, after working for 25 years for the Metropolitan Water District, I, I am fascinated by uh, any water issue. Um, to me, it's something that I could talk about endlessly. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. Um, so it's really nice and gratifying to see a crowd of people who are willing to come out and spend an evening learning more about water supply. Um, and because of my experience with, uh, with water issues, I was very excited to be asked by the Historical Society to contribute to their new exhibition, Water Changes Everything. Um, the exhibition examines all aspects of water and how it has impacted the city of Long Beach, from shaping the geography of the city to the development of the infrastructure that makes the city work. Tonight we have three special guests who are going to be talking to us about different aspects of water in Long Beach. And so I'm going to be introducing our panel this evening. I'm going to ask them to do their presentations in order, and we're going to withhold questions so that we can, can have a, a flow through the presentation. And then at the end of all three presentations, then we will take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please hold them to the end of our presentations. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Larry Rich. Larry is our geographer. He has um, assisted the Historical Society in preparing the mapping that is part of the exhibition, Water Changes Everything. And so we'll get a, a little bit of his experience. We'll get a taste of that this evening. He has a bachelor's degree in geography from Cal State Long Beach uh, with a background in GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. For those of you who don't know what they are, you'll get a, a taste of that tonight as well. He's the city's sustainability coordinator. He's accredited by the US Green Building Council. Uh, and he's going to take us tonight on a tour of Long Beach past and present and show how the natural water features have shaped the geography of our city. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Craig Hendricks. He will be our historian. He has his doctorate in history from State University of New York at Stony Brook, and he taught history at Long Beach City College and Cal State University Long Beach. He's the vice president of the Historical Society, and so his input was essential in providing the historical scholarship that goes into the Water Changes Everything exhibit. And he also worked with Rancho Los Alamitos on the film that will be premiered tonight. He will be uh, talking to us tonight about the history of cycles, uh, the history of the cycle of floods and droughts that drove the infrastructure that continues to shape the city, uh, both city of Long Beach and surrounding communities, and how we deal with both the excesses and deficits of water. Our third panelist tonight is Anatole Falligan. He's going to be our guide to the city's water supply. One of my favorite parts about the Water Changes Everything exhibit is the part that's called, Where Does My Water Come From? I loved that part. And Anatole is in a, a perfect situation to explain the answer to us. Uh, he's very well qualified for the job. Anatole has a bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from Stanford University. He has an MBA from UC Irvine. And we work together at Metropolitan Water District, so I know that he knows his water story. Um, he was lured away from Metropolitan by the Long Beach Water Department, where he currently serves as the assistant general manager. He also has a family connection to Rancho Los Alamitos, and so it's particularly appropriate that he's part of our uh, panel tonight here at the Rancho. So thank you again for holding your questions to the end. And Larry, could you get us started? All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, Joe gave me a promotion in education. I only did get a bachelor's degree from Cal State Long Beach, but I like to think I have the equivalent of a master's degree uh, from working at the city of Long Beach for 29 years. Um, and so I was really lucky you know, with being a geography major and my love of maps um, to have an opportunity at the city of Long Beach to see all their archival material um, working for the Economic Development Bureau and, and redevelopment and so on. And I took a, a strong interest in what was here before, right? What was here before the, uh, the city was, became so urbanized? And so let's back out of this. So we're used to seeing this image, right? Now, now that uh, Google Maps is such a big deal uh, and everyone's using it on a daily basis, you, you may use the aerial version or you may use just the streets version. But back in 1992, uh, an aerial photograph was kind of a rare thing that you could only see as a photograph, not even on the computer. And um, working for the city, 
you know, even in 1992 and working for redevelopment, the city was completely built out and urbanized. There was hardly any open space remaining. You know, when you look at this, uh, this image of the city, you can barely even see the open space. You know, there's some large parks on the eastern part of the city, you know, El Dorado, of course, and Rec Park. Um, but most of what else you see is just buildings and streets and, and urbanization. Well, you know, Long Beach, even though it was one of the earliest cities founded in LA County in 1882, you know, it was a natural landscape once. And where's the evidence of that in the city? And how does that former landscape inform redevelopment and, and future sustainable development? And so this uh, program, you know, it's not a, a presentation like a PowerPoint. This is going to be a live demonstration of geographic information systems, uh, or GIS. And the list of things on the left are layers. You know, there's people at the city, at the water department, that use GIS every day to do their jobs using different layers of data. And, you know, as the name layer suggests, you pile them on each other and look at the interrelationships between uh, different data sets. But there's another thing that you can do with it, which is bring in old maps and uh, geo-reference them to the current you know, uh, modern coordinate system. And so all the way back in 1992, I found the oldest map that I could that was accurate enough to uh, bring into the GIS and, and be able to kind of go back in time. And so that's what I'm going to lead off with is in the... 1890s, the US Geological Survey was busy surveying the entire United States with these great accurate maps. And there, in, in the 1893, 1894, they were doing all of Southern California. So nowadays, all of this stuff is available online, of course, as time goes on, everything finds its way online. Although this map that I'm about to show you, I originally found in the flat files at the Long Beach Main Library, um, which you know you had to go find paper maps in dusty corners of the library back then. And what it's going to show is uh, Long Beach in 1896, which of course Long Beach existed, but pretty much as a village with just a few thousand people. And so most of what is the rest of the map shows a natural landscape, um, which the thing you'll be able to pick out the most is the waterways. So. I'm going to start peeling this back. So this is our, our time machine right now where we're going to go back in time. And you know that white border that you can barely make out, that's the city boundary, right? You can kind of see Signal Hill in the middle. And so that's just for reference. Uh, it'll stay. But as I peel this back, you'll start to see blue features, um, the Watson Lakes, which are outside of the city. Um, and then down in the lower left is the estuary where the Port of Long Beach was built. Um, in the, in the modern uh, city, we're about to roll over the, the modern LA River in its flood control channel, but it's not there at all in 1896. And then here's the, where downtown Long Beach is now is the, you know, the village burgeoning town of, of uh, Long Beach just in the downtown area. And its neighbor, um, Alameda Beach, which was a separate, not an incorporated city, but a, a, a separate subdivision, now it's, of course, a neighborhood in Long Beach. Signal Hill uh, is not a city at this point, but it's uh, named as a rail stop. And they're calling the, the hill of Signal Hill Los Cerritos. And so as I peel back some more, there's Alamitas Bay. The little cluster of dots just to the left of my cursor is where we are now at Rancho Los Alamitos. And those individual little specks are uh, the, the ranch house and the barn and, and the bunkhouse. And then um, we're coming up on the, ed the eastern edge of the city where the uh, San Gabriel River is now. But there it is in 1896, meandering and braided and, uh, and wandering all over the place. And then to just finish this off, there's the, the beginnings of the city of Los Alamitos, um, which was mainly a sugar beet refinery at the time. And then our map goes right to the edge where you know, the two biggest bits of text on this map are Los Alamitos and Los Cerritos, uh, which were the full extent of the you know, uh, 10,000 acre plus ranchos um, with their nucleus at the individual ranch adobe buildings. So now that I've revealed this, um, I'm going to turn off that modern aerial and walk through some of the features that, that you're seeing here. 
uh, based around the water. So the old bay and you know the white uh, outline is still there. So you can see how the edge of the city you know, projects out into the bay with all the fill that happened related to the port and downtown development. But there used to be this nice crescent shape of the bay. And then um, just above the, the bay shoreline are the vast you know, coastal wetlands um, that we'll come back to. They're you know, mostly not around anymore, but there are some interesting remnants. And then the rivers, um, this map in 1896 labels the river on the west the Los Angeles River and the river on the east the San Gabriel River, but not too long before, uh, just in the 1860s, um, the San Gabriel River was over here, where the LA River is now, and the San Gabriel River was not over here, but rather Coyote Creek was the, the, the water course that went into this estuary. And so, um, those of you that know the history of the ranchos, uh, when um, Nieto, the Spanish soldier, was granted land, he was granted all the land between the Santa Ana River and the San Gabriel River. And so that's why uh, the, the Nieto's rancho doesn't stop here at the San Gabriel River today. It stops here of the, at the former named San Gabriel River that later became the LA River. Because at the time that this was the San Gabriel River, um, the Los Angeles River was all over the place. It, it you know, used to go into Santa Monica Bay where Bayona Creek is. Um, it used to just kind of disappear into wetlands. And then at one point, uh, supposedly in about 1825, it changed course and came south and joined the San Gabriel River as a tributary. And so the, the LA River and the San Gabriel River were actually sharing the same bed, but um, the San Gabriel River had precedent and it was uh, what was referred to, to be coming in here. So, but there's other water bodies here. There's something called the Cerrito Slough, which is um, a sort of a parallel channel, but it's like the slow channel. It was probably a former course of the river um, that became a backwater, but it was still around in 1896. And then, interestingly, there's a, a number of different creeks, right? And you know, these are things, while the rivers survive today in, in their current forms as flood control channels, um, you don't know as much about the creeks. And so there's a squiggly creek on the east side that uh, joins the, the San Gabriel River just below the rancho. And um, I used to always call it uh, Boughton Creek, but I'm gonna try to train myself to call it Bhutan Creek. Does anybody have a preference or, or think they know the answer? I, uh, it's named after General Bhutan. Um, and, uh, and I looked it up today just to get it straight. And I guess Bhutan means button in French. And so, yeah. Um, but then there's also this creek in North Long Beach that um, is called Jackson Creek. Um, that's kind of a long lost name, but it uh, lives on slightly in a little park called, that used to be owned by the water department called uh, Jackson Street Park. It should really be called Jackson Creek Park. Um, and then this little uh, guy right here is, um, doesn't really have a name, although we've given it a name um, recently as uh, Willow Springs Creek um, because of the springs that are feeding it. Because notice how short it is and how it doesn't originate. Uh, it, it originates from a batch of, of freshwater wetlands. And that's because uh, springs were flowing there and collected into a creek that flowed into the Cerrito Slough. So beyond that, there's all these other water bodies, you know, lakes, um, ponds, you know, seasonal alkali flats that are flooded. So there's all kinds of water going on on the surface here, and all of it uh, seemingly obliterated by all the urban development, right? And this water, in some cases, is coming from the mountains. The, you know, the rivers, they're originating from the mountains, you know, 20, 25 miles to the north, and flowing over the plain, and you know, building the beach. I mean, these rivers are the reason for the, the Long Beach and Long Beach because the sand that's being washed down. Um, you can make out a sandbar uh, here um, and, you know, something similar because the, the um, what is it called? The, the, well, the, the coastal current is, is washing that sand uh, downstream and, and letting it build up on the beach. But then there's these huge estuaries uh, uh, 
salt marshes um, at the mouths of the river, and this is where the land's being built, because over time, these rivers were the agent of building all of the land in the LA Basin, because originally there was just ocean and mountains at the time that the San Gabriel Mountains began to uplift only six million years ago, and the ocean adjacent to them was 10,000 feet deep, and all of that erosion that was coming out of the mountains was filling up that 10,000 foot deep trough between here and uh, PV, Palos Verdes. Uh, and slowly building up that land and pushing that shoreline out from, from the base of the mountains all the way out to here. Although it's more complicated than that because of the cycle of ice ages. Um, at one point, the shoreline was even farther out than it is today um, because the level of the ocean was much lower. And so there's actually um, cliffs and canyons offshore um, that are, have been submerged since the time of the end of the last ice age. But the last uh, natural feature that I'll call out in this is the other thing that kind of gives Long Beach its shape and divides things up, and that's the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone that crosses the city at a diagonal, and this was the fault that uh, triggered the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. Um, and it creates the Signal Hill uplift, and so you, know, you can make out Signal Hill right there in the middle. Um, but then the, the ridge line, you know, falls away from it uh, to the northwest, you know, through the area of Bixby Knolls and to the southeast uh, where Reservoir Hill is and Alamitos Heights. And so the uh, interplay between the uplift and the rivers create these additional features that, you know, were really important um, in the days of the early development and the transportation corridors. Uh, and they're lesser known today, but um, their names still live on in, in various ways. So the rivers were here before the uplift occurred. And so as the uplift was happening about 110,000 years ago, the rivers cut through it because the uplift is just happening, say, a, a millimeter a year. And so the river erodes it as it's coming up, but where the river isn't, it, the land's able to rise. So in this area, the, the river, whichever river it was, um, uh, created something that's now called the Dominguez Gap, which we know uh, about because of a, a county park there. And then down here, uh, the river created a gap um, that's called the Alamitos Gap, which we don't hear about as much, although there is something called the Alamitos Gap Barrier Project, where they inject water to, uh, into the ground to keep the seawater from seeping in. So in order to be able to visualize, so I'm, you know, I'm walking you through this, this topo map because not everyone's used to looking at topo maps. And, uh, topo is short for topography because one of the main features of a map like this are the contour lines that show you the elevation, right? And so these are the brown lines on the map that if you're a backpacker or something like that, you're used to seeing that sort of thing. But um, I have a technological cheat that will help you visualize this. And this is, so we're going to try this. Hillshade relief. So that original um, aerial photograph uh, came from Los Angeles County that flies the entire county and sells Long Beach its section. And uh, by the way, that's why uh, there was a black edge because they cut off Orange County because they were only concerned about uh, LA County. Um, but while they fly the aerial photography, they also fly something called uh, or a remote sensing uh, device that's called LIDAR. It's like laser radar. And so it's taking elevation readings of everything. And so this is this incredibly detailed map of, um, you know, you can even make out uh, the street grid where the street is slightly lower than the, you know, properties adjacent to it. Can you see, you know, like up here in Lakewood? Um, but, you know, here's the first the trough that the 405 freeway is in and then the embankment that it's on top of. But then here is, um, you know, the, the top of Signal Hill. This is Alameda's Heights, and then that edge of Belmont Heights where Livingston Drive is. And then you know, there's other uh, you know, lesser escarpments, like, like this one that's in central Long Beach. And um, yeah, you can get lost in a, in a thing like this. <laughs> so let's see. And then if we you know, pull the hillshade relief down, we can see it underneath all that other stuff, right? So let me turn this stuff off. And because this is, you know, the power of GIS is layering things, but if you get too many layers, it gets too busy and, and hard to make out. So nowadays, you know, all those former waterways 
are replaced by the current waterways um, that are all channelized for the most part. And so, here, I'll. Is that big lake in the middle of, is that lake wood? Yes, it is. So let's, we'll go to that phase of the presentation, which is, you know, we've zoomed out. We're looking at the entirety of Long Beach, but one of the fun parts is zooming in and looking at a little bit more detail. So we'll start over here. <clears throat> so this is where the, <clears throat> the port of Long Beach is now, but I mentioned the sandbar. This is the mouth of the LA River. And look at where Terminal Island should be. It's called Rattlesnake Island. And this railroad, that railroad line that comes out onto it is the LA Terminal Railroad, which was put in place in 1890, went out onto Rattlesnake Island uh, across from San Pedro, and so they renamed Rattlesnake Island Terminal Island after the railroad. And I can already see how I'm coming up on my time limit, so I'm going to pan over to this side. Unless Craig wants to grant me how many minutes? <laughs> so here we are at Alameda's Bay. These are the ranch buildings again, and <clears throat> I'm going to turn on another map and see how this works. Southeast wetlands color. So <clears throat> this is an even earlier map, <clears throat> excuse me, that doesn't look so great when it's zoomed out at this level, but when you zoom in, it gets a little bit better. And so this, well, along with this one, just shows you the, the extent of, of the wetlands. And so what I'll do to give you a sense of where we've ended up since this extensive wetlands is turn that aerial back on. So, you know, we're used to seeing this. Here's Naples and Belmont Shore and Second Street, Marine Stadium, um, Colorado Lagoon. And so, Keep an eye on, on Belmont Shore. And then keep an eye on um, Naples. Now, so, you know, Naples has a very distinct shape. You can see how the edge of the mud flats um, kind of informed that one corner. And, and then look down at this um, lower corner where the, the indentation is. That's actually a bend in the San Gabriel River that's preserved in the shape of Naples. And then over here, there's what's today known as Steam Shovel Slough, what I'm passing over, which is the, you know, the very natural, uh, or the, the single most natural remnant of the Los Cerritos wetlands. It is pretty much reflected in the in the 1896 map. So, See this channel and how back then they're mapping out in the middle of a wetland and they are capturing this undulating uh, wetland channel and while everything else has been disturbed, that little remnant is still there and we can see it as well in the... Oh, where'd it go? So this is a 1873 coastal survey that's even showing it then. So you know there are some survivors from this, um, uh, you know, urbanization. So I could go on like this for quite some time. I often do for two hours when I it's my own presentation. But I'm gonna I'm gonna try to wrap this up. This was kind of a taste of it all, right? The power of GIS and how it can really inform your understanding of the city and what lies beneath and. Is it truly obliterated or is it recoverable? You know, the, the, there can be restoration projects that happen in these areas 
And they respond really well because um, the land was a certain way for hundreds of thousands, millions of years. And you know, as long as the city's been around, which is a long time to us, it's just a blink in the uh, what. In, and so the land will return um, if if water is added. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave off with this that you know these these surface water features weren't really a source of of water. Uh, for the early city. The city was interested in um, getting water from springs and wells um, because that's you know the pure clean water that's coming up from um, underground. And But the thing that the surface water was available for was um, two things. Um, you know, irrigation to a certain degree, but also to nature and the environment, right? Because these huge wetlands supported huge populations of uh, fish and wildlife and birds in particular. And even in the early days of um, the, uh, when the wells started to be dug and, and they would overflow, and that's right, I'm gonna bring us back to this, the question about the lake and Lakewood. So Boughton Well was um, struck in, sunk in, in 1895. It created this huge spume of uh, water that, um, that shot into the air, and they, it took them a while to cap it. And so while it was flowing freely, it filled up this depression, which became a lake. And then they capped it, and it you know, became part of the Montana ranch and the irrigation system. And then eventually, uh, one of the, the water systems, well, there was a Boughton Bhutan Water Company that became the Seaside Water Company. Um, but this little building right here was the Cerritos Gun Club, or Duck Club. And so they were using a lot of this water even then um, to create habitat uh, for hunting in this case. But imagine how much of this land was available for those uses and how much of it is now not so available. And here, I'll do the, the Passover real quick with what the this huge lake became, it actually still exists to a certain degree in the form of the Lakewood Country Club golf course and the water feature in the middle of it. And so, you know, the city of Lakewood is actually named after a lake that, that somewhat still exists. Um, one last thing to consider, and I will turn off the aerial, turn on the, um, the hillshade relief, and all those uh, creeks and streams that seem to be absent from the city, they live on in a certain sense in the city's storm drain system. So here's the modern equivalent of all those creeks and streams. Some of these are open channels, you know, you see them from the street, but a lot of it is underground in pipes. And so the city is still conveying all kinds of water, most of it just straight to the LA River and into the ocean, carrying a lot of pollution. So a huge future opportunity to consider is the reuse of stormwater as a water source. And if not for domestic consumption, at least for irrigation, or especially for wildlife and the recreation of wetlands. And with that, I will stop for Craig. I can listen to Larry for 10 hours. I love that, love that stuff. You know, as an historian, my whole career is based on looking on pieces of paper and documents and reading. God, to see maps like this is just so great because it just really fleshes out the story. You really understand what humans, uh, how humans have made their mark in this area, right? So I love GIS. Geographers are my new best friends uh, because they just tell you so much about, <clears throat> so much about um, the area. So uh, today, uh, tonight, I'm just going to give a brief introduction on some of the sort of history of water, flooding, and drought in, in the history in this area. Very brief introduction, <clears throat> just a few minutes. I want to sort of give you sort of an, an overview of all this stuff. Uh, my interest in all this began when I was asked by the Long Beach Unified School District to come and give talks about Long Beach, which, of course, is a big mistake since I knew nothing about Long Beach. You know, I was born here and half raised here, but my area of concentration is modern Latin America. You want to know about Brazil and Mexico? I'm your guy, but, you know... <laughs> So but I was working and living in Long Beach, working in Long Beach City College, and the district asked me to do some stuff on Long Beach, so I got interested in Long Beach history, and my interest was stoked by my good friend Kay Briegel, uh, who in, in, interested me in working at the Long Beach Histor the Historical Society of Long Beach. 
<laughs> and uh, one of the great pioneers in Long Beach history is Kate Regal. She knows more about Long Beach than anybody, uh, living or dead. <laughs> and uh, the other person who got me involved in this is my good friend and, and researcher and good, good pal, Julian Delgadio, who was my uh, colleague at Long Beach City College. And he first got me interested in coming to work on, work on this. And he said, you know, we should really look at water stuff. I said, water? Who the hell cares about water? <sighs> so anyway, one thing led to another. and I've become more and more interested in water. So water changes everything. Uh, I'm going to start this by giving you a, a little quote here, a, a, a description, uh, because uh, what we're talking about is really a very ancient cycle. You may have gotten a, a sense for that. So there's an ancient cycle of flooding and drought that exists in, in, in the arid west and in, in Southern California. Uh, the great author Mary Austin, more than a century ago, named Southern California the land of little rain. How true that is. This cycle is irregular, often disappearing for decades, but eventually it returns. So the search for a reliable water supply has been a never-ending quest in California and in the West. Even when the human population of this region was small, flooding and drought left a severe mark on the land. Here are two examples. In the winter of 1861-62, an immense amount of rain fell for weeks and weeks. One writer described the Central Valley of California which lies between the two mountain ranges and extends for nearly 400 miles from Sacramento north uh, south to Bakersfield thusly. Nearly every house and farm over this immense region is gone. There is such a body of water, a lake 250 miles in length, 60 miles wide and 18 feet deep extending through the Central Valley. Uh, and that the winds made high waves which beat the farm, home to, farm homes to pieces America has never seen before such desolation by flood as this has been. William Brewer, another veteran of that time period, said, hundreds of thousands of cattle drowned, but not the grizzly bears, who headed for the high ground in the mountains when the rain started. Ancient knowledge, I guess. So that kind of flooding is a, is a fact of life in Southern California, in the West in general, and certainly in Southern California, where we have these periodic floods. In our lifetime, we haven't seen too many of them. Unless you're 90 years old, you might not remember the floods of 1934 or 1938, which did tremendous damage in Southern California. Terrible floods in 1914, 1916. So really, that's, that's what we're really talking about. On the other hand, we're also subject to periodic droughts. So you have an immense amount of water and heavy rainfall and flooding, and then a year later, these terrible droughts which go on for two, three, four, or five years. And you're more uh, familiar with that because we've just been through a terrible drought that went on for about almost eight years. So across Southern California in the early 1950s, cities and towns were running out of potable water. Officials estimated that cities had very little water storage above ground in 1952-53. Linwood had about 25 minutes of reserve water in 1952. 25 minutes of reserve water if the wells went dry. Southgate had about 30 minutes of reserves. Lakewood could count about 16 hours of water. Whittier, 72 hours. Not a great deal of margin for growing cities. And drought was the culprit here. In the spring, by the spring of 1951, most of the southwest United States, and certainly Southern California, from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border, had endured 15 years of drought. If you go back looking at the LA Times, historic LA Times, you don't find very many stories about this. For some reason, this was below the radar for a long, long time until after World War II, which is probably the reason why people didn't pay attention to it. But by 1950, 51, 52, a lot of people were paying attention to it. A decade and a half of inadequate rainfall, despite occasional flooding, had left the region scrambling for water supplies. In October 1952, the US Geological Survey reported that rainfall patterns were the lowest in in 14 years and part of a pattern that dated back to the 1930s and stretched across the Southwest and into the Great Plains states. Uh, the report noted other drought years earlier the century, 1903 to 1908, 1918 to 1933. So you see that these are persistent cycles. The main difference in those drought years and the present problems in 1951 clearly was the increased demand for water due to population growth. California passed a 10 million mark in 1950 with the most significant population group growth occurring in the seven southern counties, including Los Angeles and Orange. Um, groundwater supplies over much of Southern California were depleted due to excessive rain, excessive withdrawal from the aquifers and reservoirs that received little or no recharging from rainfall or, melt, or the melting snowpack from the local mountains. The two ways that underground, these underground aquifers, an aquifer is a gravel layer, grinding gravel and sand that exists anywhere from 300 feet to 10,000 feet below the surface of the earth. And these gravel is hold water. 
They're called aquifers. And they're all over Southern California. That actually is a, long, a, a, a very famous map from 1923 uh, that shows the aquifers in the Long Beach area, including that yellow one, which is the main Long Beach aquifer. It's yellow because it has a high mineral content. If you're raised in Long Beach, you know what I'm talking about. Long Beach water tastes funny. That's why. Uh, now, of course, that's been remedied by the water department, but anyway. Okay, so that, because of the excessive mineral content, ex ex excessive mineral content. Um, <clears throat> Groundwater supply, supplies over much of Southern California were depleted. Uh, reservoirs throughout the state were low or even empty by the end of 1951. Lake Elsinore went completely dry for the first time since records were kept. The report could not predict when the current drought might end, noting that it may, may turn out to be the longest and driest on record. So on one hand, we have these terrible floods. On the other hand, we have these terrible droughts. This is part of this ancient cycle uh, that uh, exists in, in our area, certainly. And the question is, you know, what have humans done over the last, uh, I don't know, 200 years especially to deal with these issues? So I'm going to tell two stories very quickly tonight, a local story and a regional story, okay? Uh, and so the search for water, uh, the control of water resources, the maintaining of a public confidence about future water supplies has, be, has uh, become a major issue uh, in uh, <clears throat> uh, the development of the state and the region. Water issues have never been far from the front pages of public concern over the last two centuries. Uh, for our purposes tonight, there is both a regional story about the search for reliable sources of water and a local story as well. The drought cycle was a recurring problem, most, notable, most noticeable and problematic as more and more people arrived in Southern California. When the local population of Southern California was 300,000 cows and 10 people, not a lot of problems. <coughs> oh, I see. Okay, that's a ranch story. <clears throat> anyway, so very small population after the Civil War, 1860s, 1870s, not very many people at all. Long Beach in 1900 had 2,200 people approximately. So not very many people, but a lot of cattle, not a big problem. However, beginning with the two wars, World War I and World War II, so 1914 to 1945, the population of Long Beach, Southern California, Los Angeles County increases dramatically. When local population remained small, in 1900, Los Angeles County had less than one million inhabitants. Long Beach only counted 2,200. Local wells and aquifers could easily meet demands. So before we had a water department, people simply drilled wells all over the property. So all over Southern California, there are 8,000 working wells around 1900. Those wells are sucking water out of the aquifers, which is okay as long as the rains come and recharge the aquifers, right? When you get a drought like 1913, 1918, you have problems. So as the county and the, city, and the cities grew, demand for water also grew, and local wells could not supply the needs. A critical moment developed with the opening of, so there are two or three things that happen really close together that really do to spin the future here for Southern California. One is the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. When the canal opens, it now allows um, Western products like coal and wood and oil to be shipped from California and the West Coast easily through the canal to the eastern cities. So the opening of the Panama Canal has a terrific impact on, on the development of ports, the Port of San Francisco, the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of San Diego, and the Port of Long Beach, the new Port of Long Beach. So the opening of the Panama Canal. The second thing that happens is World War I. World War I is largely a European war, largely on the East Coast in Europe, but, but the US Navy decided as the war went on, that they needed a presence in California. And so they picked San Pedro Bay, which is the bay shared by Long Beach, Los Angeles, Wilmington, and San Pedro, as a place to build a reliable port, a Navy base. And so the Navy comes to Long Beach. And this is, this is going to bring federal, lots of federal money is going to come pouring into Southern California, especially Long Beach, because of this. Um, so the opening of the Panama Canal, uh, the beginning of World War I, and these disastrous floods that kept happening. Terrible flood in 1914, another terrible flood in 1916. The 1916 flood virtually destroyed the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach. These are fairly new ports. The Port of Los Angeles was only about 15 or 16 years old. The Port of Long Beach was only about, at best, 10 years old. And the, the 1916 flood just destroyed everything. The docks and moorings and part of the, break, the new breakwater, Los Angeles, just destroyed. And so this event highlighted the need for large-scale approach to uh, these water issues. And this is going to bring the federal government, and most notably federal money will come down a large measure uh, into, into the area. So there are two ways to look at this. Okay, I'm going to do it on time. Okay. Uh, so there's two ways to look at this. First of all, a Long Beach story or a local story. 
For Long Beach, the creation of the Long Beach Water Department was an important milestone. In July 1911, the city bought up water companies in town, combining operations in a new water department. By 1921, the department served over 15,000 customers. Now, in this time period, Long Beach's population had gone from 2,200 to 55,000 in 1920, drawn by the discovery of oil, the development of the port, and other factors as well. <clears throat> new industry, like for the Ford, uh, uh, Ford Company, will build a plant a little bit later on. So population increased dramatically. So by 1921, the department served over 15,000 customers, had built 315 miles of water mains, installed over 600 fire hydrants. Critical importance, because fire was a major issue in American cities at this time. Fires raged out of control, because most cities are made of wood, wooden apartments, wooden houses, wooden buildings. And so you probably heard of the Great Chicago Fire of 1866 that burned down half the city. There were five Chicago fires that burned down half the city about every five or six years. Fire was a deadly, deadly problem in, in cities. So building a water system that had fire hydrants was a great, a great idea and a great success. So over 600 fire hydrants, a uh, critical element in this time period. And the department dispensed over 3 million gallons of water every day. The department thus played a key role in Long Beach's growth from its 2,200 citizens in 1900 to 55,000 citizens by 1920. Of course, that's just the beginning, 164,000 in 1930. On and on we go. So the flooding events of 1914 also convinced the county and its cities to form an agency to deal with these recurring events. So the Los Angeles County Flood Control District uh, went into operation in 1914-1915. And between the next 15 or 20 years, it tried to solve the problem of flooding with a variety of strategies. The 1960, 1916 flooding had destroyed major parts of both Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor, as I mentioned before. So this was a huge problem uh, for shipyards, uh, as the federal government had budgeted millions of dollars for naval construction. So at the very time we're having these terrible floods, the federal government is bringing in lots of money. Uh, they're building shipyards in, in Los Angeles and Long Beach. Um, and so the Navy says, look, if you're going to have a harbor here, you're going to have to dredge that harbor and make it safe for our ships. Um, so uh, because every time there's a huge flood, Debris would come down to the rivers and deposit in San Pedro Bay, right? Debris, sand, gravel, boulders. Um, so one answer was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So the federal government said the US Army Corps, sent the U.S. Army Corps en engineers to Long Beach area, and this led to costly solutions, solutions such as concreting in the Los Angeles and San Gabriel riverbeds. Now, as, as, he, as uh, Larry told you before, those rivers meandered all over the place. They were like wandering uh, merchants. Uh, and every, every time you pick up a different map, they're in a different place. Not so after 1930, because what happens is the, federal, the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers will cement in the Long, uh, San Gabriel River, cement in the Los Angeles River. Now, this was done for flood control. And we, sort of, we can't blame them for looking into the future, because obviously this is going to waste a lot of water. All this water is going to storm going to come down and be deposited in the bay, and that's the end of it, right? Now, of course, the different view would be we're going to need to save some of this water and think about reusing this water and so on and so forth. But, Remember now, in the 1920s and 1930s, the main issue was what? These terrible floods, these terrible floods, right? So concreting uh, the, the rivers, um, building large dams in the San Gabriel Mountains and, San, and uh, Santa Monica Mountains to control runoff, and dredging San Pedro Bay will lead to harbor development. <coughs> so in the case of Long Beach, they build a water department. Now, in the early days of the water department, they relied, again, heavily on these aquifers. As you can see, there's major aquifers all over the Long Beach area. And there was a lot of water. One prominent citizen said, there's an ocean of water below Long Beach. Well, there was in 1880. But by 1930, a lot of that water is gone, especially when we consider this drought cycle, right? And so Californians, city of Los Angeles, city of Pasadena, and ultimately the city of Long Beach began to look for a different solution. And the solution is the creation of this massive construction project called the Metropolitan Water District. So the idea here, as populations grow, local aquifers, local aquifers, layers of sand and gravel, could, could not fulfill water demands. The rapid growth of California cities stripped the local resources of water. So the idea here is we need to recharge this, these water supplies by tapping into the metropolitan, by tap, tap, tapping into the Colorado River system by building this uh, metropolitan water district. And so this district starts in 1927. They start building uh, the, the massive pipeline construction from the Colorado River in 1931. Finished in 1940, largely finished in 1941. Now the MWD will pipe water from the Colorado River into Southern California, and most cities, most large cities, will be begin to tap into this uh, water supply, uh, creating for the, creating finally for the first time a reliable water supply 
using the Colorado River. Uh, we also uh, began to take water after World War II from Northern California, the state water system. The overall problem, however, is never going to go away. And what's that? Well, in 1959, Governor Brown, the first Governor Brown, Governor Edmund Brown, said, I want to build a water system capable of supplying an endless amount of Californians, 25 million. Well, in 1959, that looked pretty reasonable. We hit to the 25 million mark about 1982 or 83. And now there are almost 40 million Californians. So we're living with a water system that was adequate for 25 or maybe 30 million Californians, and now there's almost 40 million Californians. So what do you do? So this, this, this search is never over. This is an endless cycle, reliable water supply, reliable, reliable water supply, tap into the rivers. Um, <clears throat> and Long Beach had a local solution. The MWD is a regional solution. Metropolitan Water District is a, is a regional solution. They're both good systems. The problem is, is there enough water? That's the big question for the future. As we go from into this 21st century, is there enough water supplies in the West and in California and in Southern California to supply the needs? Uh, and that'll be the big question for all of us I have to deal with. Thanks very much. Thank you, Larry. So my challenge is to be as interesting as the previous two speakers and I'm challenged because I'm an engineer, and we're not known for giving fantastic presentations. <laughs> and my family get together is this is where family starts to walk away. <laughs> so nonetheless, I'm going to do my best. And since what's on the screen is way more interesting than me, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to stand off to the side. And let's focus on the slides ahead for whatever I can put together for you up there. I titled the presentation today to give you a snapshot of the water department. I titled it, Today is Tomorrow's History. And now the slide will not advance. OK, one more try. I'm also PowerPoint challenged. So I titled it, Today is Tomorrow's History, because to share with you what we're doing as a community in Long Beach and what the water department is doing together, us together, our actions and attitudes about water today will shape tomorrow's history. And I want to do this in the context of some words that you might be very familiar with because you're hearing about it or you're reading about it in the newspaper. And these words get tossed around a lot. Sustainability, resiliency, and what I call the power of the word and. And for us, these words have many meanings, many values. But when it comes to water, for water, how we do this and what we do about this will define our history going forward. So before I dive down into those words, I want to show you just a brief snapshot of our water sources today in Long Beach. And it's a pie chart. We love pie charts as engineers. The teal color is about half of the pie, 50%, and that's our groundwater, our local groundwater. 40%, that blue side, that's imported water. Uh, like Craig was saying, this is the Metropolitan Water District, imported water systems from the Sacramento Delta, from the Colorado River. And since this is a pie of our total water, all of it, some of our irrigation water for our parks and what we call purple pipe, no doubt you've seen the color purple in some of those areas, that's what is our recycled water. So that's our total use, right? The important thing about this in our snapshot of today is that our groundwater basin and our groundwater rights, they represent our lowest cost. And because it's right underneath us and because it gets replenished, it's our most sustainable resource. Our imported water from MWD, because it's subjected to so many things going on in the watersheds of the Sacramento River, the entire Colorado River would drain seven states in the Western United States. That is less resilient given all the things that they're facing, whether it's endangered species, climate change, and so forth. MWD, they are a big agency. They have their own major programs to assure sustainability and resiliency. I want to assure you that they're doing that, but our topic today is Long Beach. Now, we do these pie charts all the time. And no doubt, you've heard about water conservation. And water conservation, for every drop conserved, is like another resource. So where is this resource in the pie chart? When we do the pie chart this way, conservation is the size of the pie. 
the more effort that we do to conserve water, to save water, it shrinks the size of the pie and adjusts some of these percentages. Okay, so we talked about sustainability, and sustainability has a lot of meaning. For us in Long Beach and for water, I want you to think of sustainability as, on average, I could do this every day. It's sustainable. The contrast between history and future is emerging which makes this concept, on average, I could do this every day, more challenging. What was historical, our experience, as it's been shared with you tonight, is changing. There are our predictions of longer and more severe droughts. The scientists are saying there will be hotter climate. In Southern California, there will be less rain, but more intense storms. So the less rain that falls will come in big batches, which, as Craig was pointing out, these cycles of drought and flood means these aspects of floods will become more prominent and more important for us to consider. So knowing that this emerging future is coming, I think it's important to share with you a snapshot of how we as a community have been doing to date historically, and it's actually a good story. So, Engineers love graphs. There's a lot of numbers. Don't worry about the numbers. I'll walk you through the graph. So the bars represent our total water consumption in the city of Long Beach. And I simply picked a year in time. And so this goes by decade. 1960, they start at the left and go to the right. Six, 1960, all the way to just this last year, 2019. So you can see the blue bars are rising up historically, and then they start dropping. The green line is population for the city of Long Beach. And you can see what has historically been an understanding over the years is, yes, population continues to grow and water use continues to grow. But something interesting happens towards the right side of that graph. Starting in 1990 going forward, we see water use declining and population in our city as it's built out growing and growing ever so slightly. But nonetheless, even with that, the water use continues to go down. So good story for what's coming, right? Major efforts by people in the plumbing code, changing out the toilets, changing out the dishwashers, the washing machines become more efficient. People in general know how to conserve. We've educated the kids, turn the water off when you brush your teeth, so on and so on and so on. And we often wonder, yeah, yeah, but does that really have an effect? And I'm here to tell you that it does, and the graph shows you that it proves it out. Okay, water conservation. This is my pet peeve. Water conservation is a word that we're very familiar with. If you grew up in Southern California, you know water conservation, and conservation as an idea historically was, I know that we're in a drought because someone's telling me I need to conserve, and when the drought's over, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna go back to what I was doing before. That makes me happy. So water conservation has a lot of meaning that has to do with historical. So my desire for us going forward and what we've been doing in Long Beach is to not use that word anymore. When we talk about our attitude and our approach to water going forward, we wanna talk about a water use lifestyle, an attitude, right? And we at Long Beach Water like to title it the Long Beach Way. Now, what we're talking is behavior change, right? Our attitude and our approach, not just the devices, but how we actually approach our use every day. And it's a lifestyle change that we make our own, our community, Long Beach, and we promote it, and we're proud of it. It's a sustainable water use lifestyle. When we take this attitude and approach to water, we can do this today, and we can do this tomorrow. Remember what I told you? On average, I could do this every day. Sustainability. For the past several years, our campaign has been Live H2O Long Beach to continue to promote in any number of different venues, whether it's partnerships with Cal State Long Beach athletes at their events, uh, promotional materials, Live H2O Long Beach is our campaign going forward. So what I want you to take away from this moment in time in our presentation is that when we reduce our overall consumption, we stretch our groundwater supplies. That pie gets smaller, 
and the groundwater takes up more and more of the pie. That means that we're increasing sustainability here in Long Beach. Okay. We have a number of different programs. Uh, we had a table out uh, here in front, and there's staff here tonight. If you didn't have a chance to talk with them at the start, I do encourage you, if you have a moment when the presentation's over, do speak to them if you're interested in any of our conservation programs that we have. And yes, we still call them conservation programs. So that icon is for the Lawn to Garden. The Lawn to Garden is our flagship program. It's won national recognition and national awards. It helps you change out turf landscaping and putting in California native and California friendly landscapes. There's been an expansion of that thanks to the Metropolitan Water District. So the incentive amounts have gone up. We now also cover side yards. We even cover backyards as well. It's a great, great program. Conservation or efforts to use less water in businesses are often an interesting relationship because businesses, you can't promise them that their bills are going to go down. If they're doing good business, their costs are going to go up. But we've tried an approach with restaurants here in Long Beach where if they engage with us and do some things that I admit will cost them some money, they change out the faucets, maybe change out the dishwasher, change out uh, rinse nozzles that are important for them to do their work and so forth. If they do that for us, we'll certify them. And kind of like a big restaurant rating, we call it our certified blue restaurant program. And in return, we give them something that we know they like, which is promotion and advertisement. So we promote them on social media, we promote them through any number of different venues. Tonight at our table, we had a new application that we developed that we try to interact with the public on, and that is on a tablet, if you specify the type of food you like, if you specify the neighborhood that you want to visit, then when you pick all that, it will recommend a restaurant to you. And if it recommends the restaurant to you, and to do the app, you furnish your email address, the restaurants will give you information, in some cases include a discount for you to go and, and participate in, and uh, sponsor their restaurant. So that's some of the things that we're doing on that. I want to share with you two other programs that we're doing that have to do with an, another element of the water department, which is equity of access. So we have many neighborhoods in Long Beach. Some of those neighborhoods are what we would call disadvantaged communities. By census tract and by certain categorizations, categorizations of federal income, they represent un, lower disadvantaged communities. Disadvantaged access then becomes an issue. So we're trying two different programs. One is called DIME, Direct Install for Multifamily Efficiency. And in this case, we're starting out with a pilot. We've taken money that has to do with greenhouse gas reduction because hot water sometimes uses that, right? Generates that. So we're trying to go out with greenhouse gas reduction money and go into multifamily units and replace all the devices in the unit, all of them. And then through our Live H2O Long Beach campaign, we're putting in information that helps people change their attitudes and behaviors now that we've changed everything, right? And we're going to be monitoring the water consumption to see how much savings we get. It's a pilot program. We just started out with the first few hundred units. We want to do 1,000 and see how successful it is and then move on from there. Another one that's in line with this is much like our Lawn to Garden project. Lawn to garden project. It's called Direct Install Gardens. And so this pilot, we're taking a census tract that's disadvantaged community. We're looking at certain homeowners that would qualify. And for the Lawn to Garden project, we do the direct install garden. We actually do everything for them and then do the change out. Again, with the goal to see if we can use other people's money. So this is grant funds from other agencies. And we can do this effort and then see how much water can be conserved out of doing that effort as well. So two pilot programs, but also very important for us. Metropolitan Water District, again, I'll just mention them in passing because when it comes to sustainability and resiliency, they're working on projects, and, and no doubt you'll read about them, in the Sacramento Delta and the Colorado River. Metropolitan is one of the largest water agencies in the world, and as such, it is doing everything in its capabilities to ensure aqueduct supplies are more sustainable. They also invest in conservation programs, so when we pay them for imported water, some of that money comes back to us, and in fact, our Lawn to Garden program is a big beneficiary of that funding for Metropolitan. Okay, resiliency. Little different than sustainability. So let's try resiliency this way. 
Turns out today is not average, but I can bounce back. Now with this concept, what we do for this future, today and the future ahead of us, and how we do it in terms of projects and approach from the Long Beach Water Department and us as a community, it will define our ability to bounce back in the face of hotter climate, more droughts, more severe droughts, so on and so forth. As you can imagine, when we say something about bouncing back, well, if it's hard to bounce back, we're not very resilient. We just finished at Long Beach Water what we call our Water Resources Plan. And that Water Resources Plan is a 30-year plan looking forward, taking into account these aspects of sustainability and resiliency, and what will we as a water department do for our customers here to shape that future in terms of projects. It charts a future focused on sustainability and resiliency. And I'm gonna share with you some of the results of that very broad level so you understand what we as a community are engaged in and the water department is doing for you. So the first aspect is to try to figure out how much water we're gonna be using over the next 30 years. No small task, but ask an engineer to do that, they'll be happy to comply. So I want to tell you now that this first effort of a water resources plan, we find out that for the next 30 years, our future water use is sustainably stable. Another graph that engineers love. But if I point you to the blue line on the left-hand side, and we see that those begin to cover the years of the turn of the century, and we go into 2010 and 2015, that drop is similar to what I showed you before where we were using less and less water. Going forward, that salmon colored area, that represents what the future might look like for us. Demands might go up a little bit if it's hotter than what we think it might be. Our efforts to use less water would be rewarded if it was a little cooler, and we might find our water demands just slightly less. The point of this graph to show you in the salmon area is that for the population growth that we might have in the next 30 years, we have a pretty good picture in terms of pretty stable water consumption. Okay, so if we're going to consume that much water, pretty good. Now, what are we gonna do about sustainability and resiliency, even knowing that our water use is flat? Well, our water resources plan talks about projects that we intend to do that will increase or augment our groundwater supplies. Because if you remember, I told you the groundwater is more sustainable than the imported water systems. And so we're going to augment our groundwater supplies by injecting advanced treated recycled water. Big words, but what it means is that we have access to more water that would technically go into those purple pipes, into the parks. We have more water. And so we're gonna take that and treat it even more. Technically, so you could actually drink it, but we don't let anybody do that. When we make it that pure, we get to inject it into the ground and grow the amount of water in the ground that we can then pump. So we can pump it over the actual amount that we're pumping today and grow our groundwater supplies. Another one that we're gonna do, if you recall in the maps that you saw, there was a new Port Inglewood fault. There's actually two groundwater basins. There's one north of the fault. That's the one where most of our water comes from today. There's one south of the fault generally that we would imagine more towards the LA River area today and towards the port, and that's the West Coast Basin. We haven't actually pumped from that basin before, but we have rights to it. So our goal is to develop more supplies in the West Coast Basin and make that groundwater pie even bigger. We're gonna explore stormwater capture as well. Stormwater capture doing it on a large scale, it remains a question of how to do it and how it's the cost effective way to do it. So we're engaged in future projects down the road where we'll be testing out and seeing how cost effectively could we develop certain projects on a large scale. So we're exploring all of these in this path forward for the next 30 years. Our goal with this plan is to reshape this pie. Now, from our water use, it's pretty stable, so the size of the pie itself isn't gonna necessarily change that much, but if we do our job well as a community and as a water department together, then we will reshape this pie, and so it will look like this. Up to 75% of our supplies will come from the ground, 
more sustainable, and 15% will be imported. Now that's important because when we add local groundwater supplies to our future, we reduce stress on the Delta and the Colorado supplies. They have to deliver less water, and so fluctuations in climate, fluctuations in drought cycles and all that is less stress on those. And when we do that, we're increasing resiliency. Okay, so we increase sustainability, increase resiliency. What is the power of and? I call this the power of and because I believe for us as humans, it's very easy for us and things get presented to us in binary choices. And there's a good reason for that. We love binary choices. They're simple, right? Do one or the other means that when we choose, we can choose and focus on one. But in the information that I've shared with you tonight, I want you to take away that our challenge is not or. Our challenge is and. So this water efficient lifestyle, yes, and. We need to work together to increase our local sustainable groundwater resources. And you will hear about projects in the Delta and the Colorado River being done by Metropolitan Water District. This and combination represents tomorrow's water history for us of sustainability and resiliency. And is a challenge. It represents a dedicated combined effort, the water department and the community it serves. Okay, I didn't tell you about this one. So why? Right? We can get very isolationist in our lives, and we can only focus on ourselves sometimes, and we say, well, I'll just take care of myself, and I'll be fine. When it comes to water in Southern California, I want to leave you with this perspective by sharing with you personally. So my family is one of the original families of Los Alamitos. My mother's family lives primarily, all of them, bless them, in Orange County. Some of them live in Palm Springs which is Coachella Valley Water District and gets its water from the Colorado River. My best friend from college is retired now. He lives in downtown San Diego, San Diego County Water Authority. They have desal, they have aqueduct water, they have local water, they have all these things. My compadres, godparents to my children, they live in the San Fernando Valley. They're customers of the LADWP. Their water, aqueduct water from the Owens Valley, right? My other best friend lives in Silicon Valley. He gets his water from the Santa Clara Valley Water District. He's Central Valley Project Water, includes Mount Shasta, and he's also State Project Water, including Lake Oroville and the Sacramento River. So I could be very, very focused only on one area, but I can't. Because if I was only focused on where, one area, what would I tell my family and what would I tell my friends? That I wasn't worried about them? No, I'm worried about them. So the focus on water is a collective effort, not only for us locally, but also regionally, both at the same time. I was describing to somebody very famous and I was expressing to them or trying to explain to them what we do as a water department, what we do as water utilities in Southern California. What do we do for our communities? And as I began to explain that, again, a challenge for an engineer, as I always began to explain that, this very famous person looked at me and said, you know what? You make sure that we have water every day. Very profound. And I said, yes. And I was so grateful. Now, that person is famous, right? Now, when I show you, they may not be very famous to you, but they were very famous to me. <laughs> so, Live H2O Long Beach, it represents a collective combined effort. It is the power of and. And when we do that, we understand that as we do things ourselves individually, your water and your future is our water and our future. So thank you very much for indulging me. I'll be happy to converse with you afterwards. Thank you.
Um, so we're going to open it up now. I'm going to ask the panel to come up and sit in the front. And then we're going to open it up to the audience for questions, if you have any questions of our panelists. That sounds like an Anatole question. Anatole, where does desal fit into our water supply? OK, thank you for your question. So we, we did look at desalination as well. And so one of the things that we do for the community is we chart this 30-year plan. And we look at the resources that are most cost effective that will also keep rates low for us in the future. Right now, as far as Metropolitan and its projects on the Delta and the Colorado, if those projects continue forward and projects that will help us grow our groundwater supplies, we'll be okay without seawater desal. We won't need to go for that resource. At the same time, though, we have in this 30 year plan an ability to monitor our progress. And so if things happen along the way, if Metropolitan doesn't come through with some aqueduct projects, if the Colorado system continues to get worse, right, then we have the ability to step our way in time and begin to rethink and relook at seawater desalination because then it might start to become cost effective given what our other choices are. That's a very low priority right now. It's a low priority in the sense of that we have some other things that are more attractive in terms of price. It doesn't take away that you have to monitor over time and be vigilant because if things happen, then we may need that for our sustainability and resiliency. Thank you. Uh, Anatole, can you talk a little bit about the fact that I, the, the desal plants that are located, the, the one that serves San Diego County and then there's a, a proposed one that will serve uh, parts of Orange County, um, and those are based on uh, private industry partnerships with, with public water agencies. My understanding is that the Long Beach Water Department has actually done research and has patented some, uh, some desal um, technology of its own. Is that right? We, we did historically engage in research with the federal government as well as LADWP, and it was looking at ways that we could make dramatic reductions in energy consumption because consumption of energy is the number one issue with seawater desalination. It takes vast amounts of electricity, which grow the greenhouse gas emissions, not very good for climate. So one of the things that we tried to do is we tried to see if there were ways that we could reduce the energy. The project and the research was successful. There was ways to reduce the energy. Unfortunately, there was not ways to make that a significant reduction in energy. So in the end, it was not opportunistic. We have the patent, we have it available. Uh, at this time, it doesn't look like anybody would jump on that because there's other things to do in seawater desal to try to bring the cost down. Okay, thank you. That's a big question. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about the effects of climate change, but, you know, we, we can sort of predict the areas that it's going to happen, and Anatol kind of covered that, the increased heat and air pollution and sea level rise and all this sort of thing, and, and so it increases the variability of the uh, availability of water, and I think he hit upon that our local supply, our groundwater supply, is our most sustainable resource. We don't have to, or, you know, ideally we would depend less and less on the imported stuff that... Um, you know, the Colorado River Basin is going to be getting less and less water over time, potentially. Uh, Northern California as well. So that stormwater um, angle of, of getting that back into the ground and down into the groundwater somehow um, is a really important consideration along with that continued lifestyle change. So I don't know if I answered for the water department. Sorry. It's fine. Well, from my limited perspective, remember, I'm, I'm an historian. I'm always looking backwards, not to the future. Um, so I will say this, though. Uh, in the last few years, let's say decade and a half or so, there's been a lot of emphasis on an interest in climate change, justifiably so. But, you know, if you begin looking uh, backwards, uh, people have been talking about climate change since the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, I found articles in the New York Times from the 1940s where scientists were talking about global weather changes. As, so... It's not a question of it. We're in. We're in it. We have been in it for some time. So it is the future, not the past. So the question is basically how, how is the city's infrastructure 
being protected against the impacts of climate change, including sea level rise, which uh, drives uh, impacts on uh, fresh water supplies? And all three of you can answer. Oh, boy. Um, so another huge challenge um, and, and uh, a resource issue. Uh, and you know, there's this idea that people don't like to hear, uh, and, and, but it's going to be important over time because these effects are going to happen. And in some cases, there are no fixes to it. So there's this concept of managed retreat, right? that we're going to pull back from these shorelines, these vulnerable shorelines over time, or at least not build new critical infrastructure in those zones. Um, but yeah, the, th that seems to be a uh, more inexpensive way of dealing with this than attempting to armor the coast and build, you know, trying to keep the sea back because we're not going to be keeping the sea back. So, you know, we do we do have time to get our heads around this and um, not do things that um, are going to be in the wrong place, uh, you know, come 30, 40, 50 years from now. And so, you know, maybe there's more specific uh, directions that Anna Tall can talk about in terms of water infrastructure, but the, you know, keeping um, the ocean back and, and the storm surges out of the rivers and out of the neighborhoods is going to take a, a lot of thought and a lot of engineering assistance. Yeah, that's the Venice solution, you know, build giant gates that work. Um, anyway, uh, from my perspective, perspective uh, just two brief things. So um, two years ago, the state of North Carolina, the legislature passed a law making it a felony for any employee of the state of California to, word, to use the word climate change. That'll solve it. You go to jail if you say climate change. And the second story is a couple of years ago, I, we, I got a trip to the, the Sacramento Delta, and we were traveling around the Delta Islands and touring, and uh, we we're seeing how the farmers and landowners had built up higher and higher and higher barriers against the onrushing tides. And the field biologist who was accompanying us said, but now the water is coming underneath all those barriers. And there was a dramatic pause, and he said, you know, nature always wins. Such a nice segue. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, I think it, it's insightful. Um, the discussion of climate and the Climate Action Plan is talking about those aspects. Uh, from the Water Department's infrastructure, our wells are not located near the coast. Uh, they're located much farther inland. In fact, many of the things that you might identify in wells are located in some of our parks uh, that are actually much farther um, north of where we are today. Uh, so in that sense, um, that's a little more secure. However, in Larry's presentation, he identified for you gaps, the Dominguez Gap and the Los Alamitos Gap. And going back to history, one of the first aspects of human development in the coastal plain was the pumping started to lower the water table, the water level that was actually in this groundwater basin, this large underground lake. In fact, it began to lower it, it could be, you can imagine this, lower than the sea level. And the natural effect of that is, guess what? Water starts flowing in, in this case, seawater. So in the 1940s, 1950s, it was a very common reaction in Southern California. The farmers started realizing that they were having trouble with their crops because seawater was coming in. Now, what happened then is that they created these physical structures called seawater barriers, a curtain of wells that purposefully inject water and create a mound of water. Now, it's hard to visualize. I'm waving my hands. But in essence, where if you can imagine the seawater is here where I have this hand and the groundwater is here, the wells are right in here, and this curtain of wells is creating a mound of water that's actually higher than the sea. People are pumping to their heart's delight over here, and it's a stable, sustainable supply. But the seawater barrier is what makes it happen, because the seawater barrier creates a mound of water and forces the sea back. Our challenge with climate change is to continue to use those barriers and force that water back to allow our groundwater supplies to be stable. And that's something that we're doing now. And that would be 
regardless of how significant the sea level rise becomes, we'll continue to do that. The other aspect of it is if we think about the neighborhoods and so forth that we supply, those water lines, because they uh, have to be because of the water quality, to make it sure that it's safe drinking water for you, the water lines are sealed and pressurized. So if there is water coming in that's seawater influence or things like that, the, sea, the water lines are pressurized and they wouldn't be affected in that way. So as Larry was pointing out, I mean, there's other things that happen with regards to climate change, what happens to the homes, what happens to the neighborhoods and so forth. But as far as the water system, we're pretty secure in that sense with regards to water supply. And Anatole, let me follow up on that. Is it, which agency is it that operates the seawater barrier injection wells? Which agency operates the seawater barriers? It's the um, uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Works. Okay. So you can see this is a, a regional solution to a problem that was affecting the entire groundwater basin. Yes, sir. So the question is, which agency? The city, city of, Long Beach. of Long Beach producing bottled water. And what was the reason? And is it still going on? That's an excellent question. I can't tell you why it was done. Um, Export to France, obviously. Yes. <laughs> that would be a novel idea. Um, right. So at a time, uh, there was this idea that um, as a promotion, uh, many water departments, not just Long Beach Water, many water departments all over Southern California for hosted events and so forth, they would bottle their water in plastic bottles, label it, and then make it available at events. Now, it represents a practice from way back. We all know today in our environment, we don't really talk about or encourage the overuse of plastic bottles over and over again. And so we kind of pulled back. The other thing that was important to note is that uh, many times in trying to do that, we were creating this certain perception with the public, right? And they'd be saying, if you're giving me the bottled water, um, is something wrong with my tap water? <laughs> we're trying to say, no, 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 no. It's just for this event tonight, we just kind of wanted to make it available to you, right? So we tended to discourage that. Um, so that's the, the beginning and end of that story on bottled water. OK. So the, the question has to do with uh, the fact that our aquifer re, re, relies on recharge from surface flows that come in. And so all the river beds have been concreted over to a large extent by the Army Corps of Engineers, as, as uh, Craig described. And, and most of the people have concreted over I mean, the streets and driveways and houses. Um, we've concreted over a lot of the natural uh, landscape. And so how are we um, taking steps to recharge our aquifer? So your, your question about the Santa Ana River. So if you, um, let me get my freeways right. If you drive up the 57 freeway um, and you happen to be in Orange County, you're going to go past Angel Stadium. And if you look at the Santa Ana River there, uh, you'll find this really interesting feature. You find the sides are made of concrete, kind of like our Los Angeles River and San Gabriel River here. And like you pointed out, the bottom, the bottom, when you drive by, you'll see it. The bottom is not only just a sandy bottom, it has like a maze in it, right? And so the way that's created there is because that groundwater basin, the Orange County groundwater basin, at that point near Angel Stadium is an entry point into the gravel layers that are underneath the ground. Groundwater basins themselves can be developed in a way naturally where they wind up with clay layers above them. And the clay layers is almost as rock hard as concrete the water won't move up, right? And so the water underneath it is highly pressurized. In fact, some of the historical context for, yeah. um, for Long Beach with the concept of springs, Fountain Valley, which was a fountain, right? Artesia, which is artesian, was anybody who poked a hole like they were drilling for water, the very first thing that happened is the water shot up like a geyser, right? That was all the pressure underneath because it was contained. In the Santa Ana River near the Angel Stadium, that represents an entry point. The layers lend themselves, and the water will literally suck into the ground. The maze that you see in the riverbed near Angel Stadium, that's to slow the everyday water flow and make sure that not a drop is wasted and it goes into the ground. For us here in the central basin, where we come from, 
we are not so blessed to have an entry point into the aquifer within the city limits of Long Beach. And so in the vicinity of our city, Los Angeles River and the San Gabriel River, there's, if you had a bottom to it, it wouldn't get into the aquifer. It would just go out to the sea or go into the local area. So when it comes to groundwater supplies, those areas are located farther north in the communities of Montnovello, Pico Rivera, Whittier, and those areas up the 605 freeway, those are big entry points. And if you drive along the freeways, you'll see these big areas. And that's what's feeding our groundwater basin and feeding our groundwater supplies that we pump. Now, notwithstanding something important that Larry mentioned, is that as residents in our community, we can always do things to help our local runoff and help our local gardens by trying to capture as much storm water as we can to just help feed the gardens that we have. One of our features in our Lawn to Garden project, if you do that project with us, is we'll ask in the design that you create features that capture local runoff. This is incredibly important for another reason for us as a coastal city, and that's because we have beautiful beaches that we want to keep pollutants in the runoff from getting to them. So any effort that we do has a double benefit, right? We get to irrigate our local gardens, but we also control some of that runoff before it gets to the beaches, improving the water quality. That was a long-winded answer, but I hope that helps. Uh, just a brief uh, comment. Uh, you know, when, when uh, the state and county and local officials asked for federal help in the 1920s and 1930s, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers responded, they're engineers. And they said, help us. And the engineer said, we'll help you. We'll stop the floods. And they cemented in the rivers. That was an ideal solution for that time. Now, here we are 70, 80 years later, and we see that um, things have changed, ideas have changed, and it's remarkable how local water agencies like the city of Long Beach and Metropolitan Water District have now switched to a kind of a a sense of we have to preserve as much water as possible. That's why you see new, new buildings when they go up, like Long Beach City College has built a new building. And on that, on that campus, there's a depressed area that is supposed to capture water. And many new buildings in California will have that feature now, would capture water. OK, I would, I would like to add to that, um, since John Allen was here tonight, that we also have a local agency that is specifically tasked with the job of replenishing the groundwater base, and that's the Water Replenishment District. And so one of the things that they do is take water out of the rivers as well as um, recycled water and put it into settling basins so what, when there are areas where the ground will take in the water, that's, that's what they do. Okay, uh, can we have, okay, one last, or maybe, okay, two last questions, yes. Okay, so the question has to do with the plans to improve the Los Angeles River and make it a more environmentally friendly uh, waterway. Right. And the question is whether that will have any impact on the water supply for the, for the groundwater basin. It will have an impact on groundwater supply for the groundwater basins. Um, it is what it is. So the news is not promising for the groundwater supplies for us. It's promising for the groundwater supplies for the city of Los Angeles. So the restructuring of the LA River is to make it a more natural stream course and to also take advantage in the uppermost portions of the Los Angeles River and capture that, that water before it actually gets down here. Um, you might ask, and it's perfectly fair to say, well, you know, Long Beach, Compton, uh, Southgate, all these cities that you know along the Los Angeles River, you might ask, well, what does that mean that you're capturing all the, all the water up there? Well, turning to Mr. Vanderhorst, there's a legal terminology that applies to the city of Long Beach, to the city of Los Angeles, sorry, and it has what they call Pueblo rights. From the original founding of the city of Los Angeles, they have first in time, first in right access to that water. So if they capture it upstream, they get to hold it. Now, the Los Angeles River is not a big contributor to our groundwater basin that we pump from. It's actually the San Gabriel River. So we're, we're fine in that regard. But your question was, how does, that how does that affect maybe increase? It won't necessarily increase the supply. It will beautify the river. And so in that aspect, it'll make it a much more livable river and one that we hopefully get to enjoy as far down here as Long Beach. But the water itself, Los Angeles is making every effort that it can to capture because of this concept of Pueblo rights. Yeah. Okay, one last question. 
Okay, so the question has to do with uh, water quality uh, within our groundwater basin and the fact that we're injecting recycled water and as well as wastewater from, from certain industrial processes. And so how does that impact our water quality? Okay, so th let me go, because your questions were multiple. So let me start with the ending portion of your question and I'll work back to some of your initial questions. So recycled water, putting it into the ground. When I described it in the presentation, I said it was advanced treated. Um, this aspect of doing advanced treatment to recycle water and putting it into the ground is not new. It's well established. It's actually done on a large scale uh, and feeds most of the groundwater basin in Orange County. So to give you a sense of, to your question about pollutants, right? What do I mean by advanced treatment? Um, the same process that gets described to desalt the water from the ocean, to literally remove everything from that water, that's the same process that gets used in this, what I call advanced treatment. It's called membrane reverse osmosis. Um, the membrane is so uh, strict that it doesn't let a majority of anything get through. Uh, you almost get close to in fact, you do get very close to what we call distilled water. Now, if you've ever bought distilled water at the supermarket and then had the unfortunate effect of trying to taste it, you would find out it's terrible. Um, but that's because it's distilled. It has nothing in it. Now, advanced treatment is to not stop there, actually. Advanced treatment is to then take that water and hit it with ultraviolet rays to take away and disinfect anything left that was in that. The water that comes out of that advanced treatment is technically more pure than any water that you get from the tap. That's how severe the treatment is to address a concern, which is a valid concern, is that for everything that's coming out of our sewage treatment plants, when we make that recycled water, how do we assure ourselves of pollutants and all that stuff that that's not in there? And that's because advanced treatment is required before it goes into the ground. So there's that element of that water stream. Now, the other, what I took away from your questions was there's this other element that our groundwater basin is different than other basins in the California and in some basins across the Western United States. They, this is what we call a confined aquifer. So the clay layers that I told you, this confinement protects us from what happens at the surface. Not everything is that way. There was, in your question, there was a discussion of the Central Valley. The Central Valley in California, many portions of that area is ancient seabed. There's no clay layers anywhere. What happens at the surface in the Central Valley goes straight down into the aquifer. And there's been issues with uh, oil wastewater, uh, pollutants from agricultural drainage and so forth getting into the aquifer supplies. Here, for us in Long Beach, the aquifer is confined. So things that happen at the top happen in this zone at the top. They don't affect our water supply. Now, that's a blessing for us in terms of pollutants and so forth. So does that give you a sense of what you were asking? So... That is some amazing information from many uh, expert sources. Our job here at Rancho Los, Amigos, Los Alamitos is to bring the information home and make it real and personal, and there is not a better place to do that than this amazing site that you're now sitting in. To be a Rancho Los Alamitos is to be at the focus of the original settlers who came to this land and settled here on this property very close here because there was a natural spring. The Native Americans who were the original people to settle in this land found this area to be a sacred site and this is where the communities were formed according to their traditions. We have used the story of Rancho Los Alamitos because this tells the story of water in this area through an evolutionary process and the development of our communities and our lands. 
So with the support of the Long Beach Water Department and many of the experts that you see and, and uh, also resources from the Metropolitan Water District and many other places, we have created a narrative that tells the story of water and brings it home in a meaningful way. And the purpose of this is to use this historic site and what it represents to, as an educational tool for children and visitors who come to this site to understand why water formed this land, what effect it had, but why is this going to inform us for the way that we live our lives into the future? So our project here at Rancho Los Alamitos was to tell the story of water through a written narrative and then translate that into a film. So it was a great experience working on this project. We worked on it for more than a year. The story of water is so fascinating and some of the most interesting stories, in fact, I'll give you one highlight of the thing that stands out in my mind, was uh, the story of the, the, the well that was drilled in Signal Hill, the Bhutan well, as you were describing, which shot a geyser of water 80 feet into the air for a year. And that water was so visible that People used to come down from LA on the red car to see the geyser that was formed, that was, uh, the, and the water, of course, went in to uh, form the lake and became the city of Lake, Lakewood that we now know. So that's one story, but there are so many interesting stories. And these are the things that we want to tell the people who come here because this is the story of water and why water is so significant for our area. So uh, we will have the, the water narrative available. I want to recognize Craig Hendricks, who was our author, uh, and some of our uh, local people contributed to this also with our historic photos and narratives and stories and interviews and so forth. So we have a great story to tell. This story is translated into this film, which we will be using here at Rancho Los Alamitos in the future. So if you want to go ahead and show the film. Welcome. Today, as you wander through our beautiful gardens, we invite you to remember that it is water and our ability to use its life-giving power that makes it possible for us to call this Alamitos, the ranch of the little cottonwoods. You see, cottonwoods grow where water is plentiful, and that's where our story begins. As a history buff, this map says it all. From time immemorial, two rivers flowed from the mountains to the sea. Today we know them as the Los Angeles and the San Gabriel Rivers, and together they form the floodplain that Long Beach was founded on. Adapting to the natural cycle of droughts and floods these rivers constantly change course as the amount of water in them rose and fell. We live in a crowded place with millions of people around us. Concrete can be seen for miles, and water flows from every faucet, making it easy to forget that this once was a floodplain where the natural cycle of floods and droughts impacted the choices people made to stay alive and thrive. The rancho, Rancho Los Alaminos, as it's referred to today, is so special and sacred because of the stories that are connected to it. There were springs all over the Los Angeles basin that we don't see anymore. The cleanest, safest forms of water were going to be in those springs in those artesian wells. My ancestors, my Tongva ancestors, survived for not a few hundred years that way, but for thousands of generations. You know, we didn't find the spring, the spring found us. As I've researched the area, I've found maps that show how the levels of water have changed dramatically as more of us have come to live here. When the Spanish arrived in California, they pushed the native inhabitants off their land and displaced them into other regions. The Spanish also brought new plants and animals like cows and sheep so they could feed their ever-growing population. 
The lush rivers and streams provided an abundance of water for the people and the animals on the land. Over time, the land was divided and purchased by different families who began to dig wells in the underground aquifer. At one point in the 1890s, water in the area was so plentiful that an artesian well could create a geyser 80 feet in the air. But the rapid population growth at that time caused all of the aquifers to also deplete rapidly. The next period of California history is really exciting. First, the entire California territory changed hands after the Mexican-American War of 1848. Second, gold was discovered in Northern California that very same year, bringing the greatest migration of people ever recorded in history to one area. To meet the demands of this population explosion, ranchers bought up land to expand their ever-growing cattle businesses but it was the third. The Great Flood of 1861 and the incredible forces of nature and the subsequent drought that changed much of the state forever. Just like the floods in the Midwest, the flooding in this area brought devastation, taking human lives, ruining farms, and drowning cattle in unimaginable numbers. The once profitable ranches flowing with cash, now faced bankruptcy. Suddenly, new opportunities arose for families like the Bixby's. The rancher belongs to the city of Long Beach now, but, but every time I drive through the front gates, I still think of it as, as home. The trees, the beauty of the gardens, the, the way it's laid out, the buildings, they all have memories. It started in 1878 uh, when my great-grandparents leased the property. And then 1881, they purchased it with two other partners. And then we gave it to the city in 1968. So we've had 90 years of family occupancy. And then since then, people have been here or working here or living here continuously since that time. So it's been a tradition. The Rancho itself is a place full of life with a lot of work, a lot of tears, a lot of joy, and tremendous challenges. As the Bixby settled into life on the growing ranch, the area around them began experiencing dramatic changes with many towns springing up. Los Angeles became a large metropolitan area. By 1910, there were already 17,000 people calling Long Beach home and 300,000 in Los Angeles County, needing water to keep them alive and able to pursue their dreams. Open land, once used for grazing cattle, gave way to housing tracks and large developments, attracting even more residents. As the population grew, the demand for water also grew. The underground water table was being used up far faster than annual rainfall and snowmelt could replace it. Accessing and distributing a diminishing supply of water to more people became a huge challenge. By the early 1900s, there were several water companies who ran a business accessing and distributing water. Soon it became clear that to become a proper city with real boundaries, water distribution needed to be controlled by one company. By 1911, the city had purchased several of these smaller companies and started a citywide department, the Long Beach Water Department. At the same time, the local oil boom of the 1920s almost tripled the population of the city. This growth required the drilling of more wells, drawing an ever-increasing amount of water and causing the water tables throughout the entire region to rapidly begin drying up. By 1931, when the city of Long Beach voted to join the Metropolitan Water District's project to bring water from the Colorado River to Los Angeles, it was clear to many local residents that more water was needed. My grandfather, Fred Bixby, he believed that the water would last forever. It had been there for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't it still stay there? But he, he didn't want anything to change, so he was, he was not in favor of the project. Although Fred Bixby continued to oppose the project to import water, the need would eventually affect even the Bixby Ranch. By the 1950s, the water level in the wells on the ranch had dropped so far that the decision was made to connect to the city water system. Today, our primary water source is groundwater, supplemented by purchased water like that that comes from the Colorado River. 
which is imported through a maze of concrete canals and tunnels that start 242 miles away. It's that same system that was conceived in the 1930s by visionaries that were looking to solve the water crisis that loomed during that time. Here at Rancho Los Alamitos, we never forget that it was water that brought the first settlers here, or that it was the cause of great prosperity, as well as ruin for those who came before us. Today, reliable, clean, high-quality drinking water is a foundation of our Long Beach community. The cycle of floods and droughts in Long Beach continues to this day, while our demand for water continues to escalate. At the Water Department, we are committed to finding solutions and implementing those solutions before it becomes a devastating crisis once again. Already with climate change, there are places in the world where there's not enough water. I think one of the things that we have learned from our past in Long Beach is that we cannot take water for granted. So we have an important lesson to learn here at Rancho Los Alamitos from Fred Bixby and the many generations who came before and after to live, work, and play here. And the lesson is this. We, each of us, must act responsibly to support a sustainable lifestyle. And that means saving water every day. As the past has shown us, it is the Long Beach way. And now, it is up to us. So let's be ready. So we have a great educational tool to work with. But I think one of the great things that came out of working on this project is the fact that we found that there are many organizations in our city and in our region that care about water and that are working on water projects every day. And we had a chance to coordinate together to support each other's projects and to raise the awareness of water in our community. So we established an informal group called the Friends of Long Beach Water. And we have a website called Long called Water Matters LB, Water Matters Long Beach. We would love to involve anybody who cares about water, who wants to see water become part of our everyday conversation to join us and make sure that we could continue to create water awareness, not only with our educational programs, and we certainly here at the Rancho will do that, but throughout our city. So please go to our website, Water Matters Long Beach, and thank you very much for being here tonight. I know our, our panel will stay around and answer some of your questions, and, and we appreciate you coming. Thank you. <laughs>